Welcome to the Women Leaders Association Daily Member Podcast, where we believe we go further, faster, and have more fun when we go together. I'm your host, Julianne Kirkland. And in each Daily Member Podcast, we will pick out a great speaker from one of our meetings that we thought you would enjoy. You can access hundreds of recent speakers, book summaries, great articles, and more at no additional charge through your membership portal. If you would like to get involved in a Women Leaders Association Mastermind Group or find a networking group near you, or if you just need access to the membership portal, simply go to womenleaderspodcast.com to be connected. Now let's tune in for this incredible message. Um, my name is Molly Gimmel, and I am an entrepreneur. I have two companies. One is a government contracting firm that I've had for a little over 20 years. And the other I just recently started, which is called Volamo Leadership Institute. It is an online um, leadership training platform. And uh, I started it because I was working on creating an online course based on the book that I wrote that came out um, in April, which is called Master Your Mindset, How Women Leaders Step Up. So like I said, um, this presentation is based on my book, Master Your Leadership Mindset. And so we're going to talk today about developing a leadership mindset and what that means. So next slide, please. So I am a big fan of leadership quotes. Um, I actually do a daily leadership quote every day and post it to the Valamo LinkedIn page. So if anybody's interested, um, feel free to follow us on LinkedIn. Um, this one I think is really great because it says leadership is hard to define and good leadership even harder. But if you can get people to follow you to the ends of the earth, you are a great leader. Um, and I think that's so applicable because leadership is hard to define. There's not just one thing that makes somebody a good leader. And Indra Noy, who's really interesting to me, she is the former CEO of PepsiCo. And I actually was reading an interview with her and she talks about um, she had met with Steve Jobs and Steve Jobs had told her that she was too easygoing, that she needed to, you know, raise her voice now and then yell and scream, throw things across the room to that makes people know that you care. <laughs> and so she said, you know, she thought about it. And while she did start raising her voice every now and then she never threw anything because she was afraid of what would happen. And the truth is we, we all know what would happen, Right. Um, she would have been fired. <laughs> the board would have been in an uproar. The stock would have tanked because women are not allowed to be the same, to demonstrate the same kind of behaviors that men leaders are. Um, but fortunately, I think society and the business world is, especially is starting to change. And the things that are characteristics of a good leader are now more characteristics or attributes that are more um, aligned or traditionally um, credited to being women's attributes. And men are starting to adopt them too. So we'll talk about that more um, going forward. Briefly, a little bit about me. Um, I spent 10 years in the big five consulting firms um, prior to starting my company in 2001. And in those positions, you know, for those of you who are familiar with those companies, they're very hierarchical. You first, you come in at this level and then each year you're expected to raise up one level. Um, so over the years, I was progressively given more leadership responsibilities. I was asked to lead teams. I was put in charge of people, but I really wasn't given much training on how to do that. Um, then in 2001, I left my company and started or left the company that I was at, the consulting firm, and started my own company with one of my coworkers. Um, we actually founded the company, <laughs> filed our incorporation papers, and gave our two-week notice on Monday, September 10th, 2001. And then the next day, the world completely changed, and we were like, oh my God, what did we do? Um, but we decided to keep it going, and 20 years later, we um, we're still going 21 years later, we're still going strong and my business partner and I are still, still business partners and still don't hate each other, which is <laughs> very unusual. I think anyway, um, shortly after starting my company, I joined an organization called NABO, which is the national association of women business owners. And I joined that because I really didn't know how to run a business. I had never done it before. I had always worked in corporate and I didn't know how to sell. I didn't know how to hire people, um, all the things. And so I joined NABO to 
get that kind of education because that's what NABO is a, one of the main things that NABO is about. So I served on my local chapter board for several years. I was chapter president. Then I started getting involved at the national level. NABO is a national organization that has chapters all over the country. Um, served on a couple committees and then served on the national board and including one year as chair of the national board. So in that capacity with that organization, I really started getting interested in leadership because I would see situations where there would be a chapter that was growing and thriving. And a few years later, it would be struggling or vice versa. It would be struggling. And a few years later, it'd be growing and thriving. And when you looked at the reasons behind all that, it was always leadership because all of our chapters are run by volunteer boards of members. And the chapter president had a huge difference um, in how successful the chapter was and how how well it was doing. Um, and it was based on if that person was a good leader. And it changed every year because every year we've got a new president. And so some of the chapters would just go up and down and up and down. And so it made me really interested in, you know, what makes someone an effective leader? So I started studying, read, read a lot of books, took some workshops on leadership, got my graduate certificate in leadership. And after I wrote the book, I decided to um, found the Valama Leadership Institute as an online community for women leaders to create a network of support, be educated, learn more about what it takes to be an effective leader and um, provide that mentoring for women leaders. Here's what I have to say is that you are a leader, even if you don't think you are. Um, maybe you don't have a job title that makes it sound like you're a leader, but leadership isn't based on job title. Leadership is about influence. Leadership is about getting other people to do what you want. So you can be a leader in your company, even if you don't manage any people technically, or um, even if you don't have a job title that makes it sound like you're a leader, you can step up and volunteer to, you know, um, work on a special committee or um, manage, uh, uh, organize the birthday parties or whatever. Um, you're a leader in your community. You're a leader in your kid's school, in volunteer positions, or in, in your family, for sure. If you have kids, you're definitely a leader. Soon after I wrote the book, one of my former employees actually reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, you know, she was, she's in a different job now. She The contract that she was working on for us uh, ended a few years ago, and she's kept in touch. She said, I'm trying in my new job, my new company, to take on more leadership type roles, but I just can't get any traction. They see me as this. And how can I, you know, improve my leadership skills? And I said, you know what? Find a volunteer organization, some kind of nonprofit organization whose mission is important to you and volunteer and, you know, ask to be put in charge of a special project or to help with a fundraiser or do something that gives you that experience in a leadership position. Um, and then you can take that and translate it to your job. So I would make that same recommendation if any of you are feeling the same way. What do you think is the most important attribute for a leader to possess? Empathy, emotional intelligence, both, both good ones. Any others? Example, lead from the front, listening, all good. Yep. So these are some of the ones um, um, that people regularly say. And here's the thing about leadership attributes. The problem is that there's not just one. There's not just one key attribute that you can master and become a great leader. You really need to try to master all of them. Um, and that's hard, but think about it. You know, um, you can have a great vision, but if you can't communicate it, then um, nobody's going to want to, nobody's going to understand and want to follow you. Or you can have great communication skills, but if you don't have a vision to explain where you want to go, again, nobody's going to want to follow you. If you don't have empathy, which I saw somebody put in the chat, no one's going to like you or want to be around you or want to follow you. So all of these things are important. And um, it's important to figure out which ones you're good at and which ones you're not and 
work on improving the ones that you're not. Um, great, leading from the front, listening, understanding my needs, all, all very, very important. Being an effect lead, effective leader has two components. And the first is, you know, what's happening in your head. And the second is your behaviors and actions. And both are equally important. Um, for purposes of this presentation, we're going to talk about the first one. Well, what's happening in your head? So in my book, Master Your Mindset, available on Amazon uh, <laughs> or wherever you buy books online, um, I came up with this list of 13 different mindsets, and I grouped them into two sections. One is connect with yourself, and two is connect with those you lead, because connection is really important, too, as a leader, because I think if, if your people you lead don't feel connected to you, then they don't want to follow you. Um, I just read a statistic that says something like 54% of all people who left their jobs say that they did so to get away from a bad manager or boss. So I think it's really important that um, if, you, if you don't want to lose your people all the time, um, you need to figure out how to be a better boss. And this is the first step in that process. So in the book, I have a different chapter on each of these topics. And um, what I did was I... I wrote about the topic, I shared some personal stories about it, and then I interviewed about 30 different women who are leaders in a variety of industries. And I gave them this list and I asked them, you know, pick two or three that have been important to you in your leadership journey and that resonate. And let's just talk about them. You can share, you know, what you think about them, if you have any stories. And so I wove those into the chapters as well. So for today, Obviously, I don't have time to talk about all of them. So I picked um, six that we'll, we'll briefly talk about. And um, if you have any questions, you can save them for the end and we can have a conversation about any of these or even the ones that I'm not talking about <laughs> if you're interested in um, or have any questions about those. All right. The first one is control your mental chatter. Now, what is mental chatter? Mental chatter is that voice in your head, right? We all have it. We all have that voice that's sitting there going, Oh my God, I'm hungry. What am I going to have for dinner tonight? I have to stop by the grocery store. What am I going to get? Um, oh, I have to take the um, kid to soccer practice. Oh, uh, oh, they have this party this weekend. What am I going to wear? And, you know, that voice is just going all the time, right? Sometimes you don't even realize it is, but it is. <laughs> it's just chattering away 24 seven, except for when you're asleep. And here's the thing about your mental chatter. Some people think that the voice in your head says something means it must be true. And that's not the case. Cause a lot of times what the voice in your head is saying are things that it heard other people say to you or to other people. So for example, um, if you had parents that were really critical and, or teacher, or if you were bullied when you were a kid and you know, they were saying things like, oh, you're not smart enough to do that. You're never going to succeed. Um, you're no good at that. All any of those things. The voice heard that. And now, years and years later, just repeats it because it, that's what it heard. doesn't mean it's right. It just means that that's what it heard. Um, one of the women I interviewed for the book talked about the fact that she came from a family that did not value education. And she had decided she was going to go to college. Um, she was, no one in her family had ever gone to college. And when she told her grandmother that she was going, her grandmother was like, why on earth would you want to do that? That's just stupid. And she really had to tell herself because, because later as she was applying for colleges, she kept hearing that voice. The voice kept repeating to her, you know, oh, do I really want to go to college? Isn't it really, is it a waste of money? Maybe I shouldn't. And she said, no, I do want to. And so she had to shut the voice down and tell it um, to stop saying that, basically. <laughs> um, and what, that's, an, that's something that I've learned is that one way to get the voice in your head to stop saying negative things to you is to talk back to it. You know, you can also, one strategy that I've learned is you can name your voice. So the voice in my head, I call it Stan. So when it starts up and say, you know, Oh, you, you know, you're, you're too fat to wear that dress. Oh, you're not smart enough to do that. Shut up, Stan. I can do that. I'm smart enough. Or shut up, Stan. You're wrong. 
So some people seem to think that the voice in your head, because you, you hear people say, oh, trust your gut, trust your intuition. And people think that the voice in your head is your intuition. It's not. I'm here to tell you it's not. So what you want to do is you want to get that voice to become your fan and not your critic. Um, and that is the first step. And, and one of the reasons I have this as chapter one is because I think it's so important that you turn off that inner critic, that you make it into a fan, because if you don't, it will always be undermining you and it will always be keeping you from being the best leader that you can be. Okay. Imposter syndrome. Um, I've been hearing a lot about imposter syndrome in the news lately. Uh, it seems to be a big topic of conversation and what imposter syndrome is, if you haven't heard of it is the phenomenon when you're in a situation and you feel like you don't belong there. You think that you're an imposter, you're a fraud, um, you're not qualified. And it usually happens in a situation that's a new situation for you. Um, and often a situation where like, for example, you've been promoted into a new job and you don't feel like you're qualified. Uh, one of the women in my book talked about the fact that she was in a PhD program and <laughs> the woman who turned, who um, coined the phrase imposter syndrome was there doing a speech about imposter syndrome. And she felt imposter syndrome because she didn't think she deserved to be there, that she wasn't as smart as all that everybody else in the room. Um, and that's what imposter syndrome is. When you think that, you know, everybody else is smarter than you, they're going to figure out that you are really an imposter. You're a fraud. You're going to get found out. Um, it's quite common. Um, I've seen studies that say up to 70% of people have suffered from imposter syndrome at any given time. And I think the way to get over imposter syndrome, one is just time. Um, once you've been there, done that for a while, you'll realize that you're not an imposter, you're not a fraud, you haven't screwed anything up and nobody's gonna kick you out. Um, but if you wanna get over it quicker, maybe the, I think one of the good best ways to get over it quicker is to really examine what it is that's making you feel like an imposter. Is it you think that you're not as smart as everybody else? Is it that you don't have as much experience? Is it that you haven't had as much education? So figure out what it is that's making you feel like an imposter and do something about it. So if you feel like you haven't had as much education as the others and don't have as much knowledge about the subject, go find a class to take, go find a workshop, go find a video to watch. Um, there's stuff about everything out there that you can that you can find and learn from. You know, a lot of people also say, fake it till you make it. And sometimes that helps too. The other thing to do is to tell yourself, you know, I do kind of feel like an imposter. I do, I do feel not as qualified as these other people, but let's look at that situation. Am I really not as qualified as them? Am I really not as smart as them? Well, no, actually I am, you know, there's a famous quote Michelle Obama said she was asked in an interview um, how she did not get imposter syndrome when she was in meetings with all these really high powered people from all over the world, Go, um, government officials and Nobel laureates and all kinds of different, really, really accomplished people. And um, she says, you know, I've been in a lot of rooms and sat at a lot of meeting tables with a lot of those types of people. And the thing that I realized pretty quickly is that they're not that smart. <laughs> she said that she said, you know, they're, they're just, they're hanging on to power, um, as much as they possibly as can, because that's what they can, want, but they're really not that smart. Your daughter is having imposter syndrome when applying to colleges. She can, uh, absolutely. She can get into Duke. Um, you can talk to the under 21 crowd the same as, as you would talk to an adult about imposter syndrome. Um, why does she think she couldn't get into Duke? I'm sure she has just as good of grades uh, and SAT scores, all the other reasons. And you know what would might help? Do a, do a vi campus visit and have her walk around and meet people and realize that she's just as smart as the students who are already there, right? So integrity. Um, integrity is one of those characteristics that's off almost always someone, when I ask at the beginning, you know, what's the most important attribute someone says integrity, they didn't hear today, which is interesting, but almost always that one is on the list. And a lot of people don't really fully understand what integrity is. People think integrity is about being honest 
And it is, but there are other aspects to integrity beyond just honesty. Um, I see integrity as having three parts. The first part is honesty. The second part, though, is doing the right thing. So you you know the, what's the right thing to do, right? And sometimes you do the right thing because you're being watched. But having integrity is doing the right things, even if nobody is going to know about it. And um, I think that that's a really important part of integrity. So not just honesty, but doing the right thing. Um, and then the third part of integrity that's important is um, living in accordance with your values and leading in accordance with your values. So if, for example, you say that you're, you value diversity and inclusion, but then in practice, everybody on your management team looks exactly the same, <laughs> then that's showing that you're not in integrity with your values. And so I think all three of those aspects of integrity are equally important. Um, um, this is one that I think is really important. And a lot of people don't think about it, but you can't take things personally as a leader. Um, a lot of things as women, a lot of times we take things personally, even when they're not. Um, say a client cancels your con contract. Um, a lot of women will be like, oh no, they canceled my contract. They must not like me. They must not think I did a good job. Um, you know, they take it personally. It's about them. Well, the truth of the matter is it could have been about a thousand other reasons that had nothing to do with them. They could have lost the budget. They could have um, changed priorities, launched a new project that required those resources. It could have been any number of things. And men don't do that. Men don't take things personally. This is, this is one of those attributes that's really a woman thing because men really don't take things personally, but women do. And in order to be a more effective leader, you need to stop. Um, sometimes, even if you know it's personal, even if the client canceled the contract and told you because you did a crappy job, you've got to just let it go. Um, you can be pissed for a while, you can be mad, you can be sad, but you've got to be able to let it go and um, not let it become a personal issue, not dwell, not stew and move on forward. I think it's really important. And this is one of the hard ones and it's hard for me too. I mean, this is one of the ones I struggle with the most is taking things, don't taking things personally. Um, I had a situation where I was on this committee. I was actually chair of a committee um, for an organization that I volunteer for. And um, a new board came in and one of the board members decided that they wanted to take over that committee. Now, it wasn't because of anything I had done. It was just that they wanted to do it. And um, they were a board member and I wasn't. And so therefore that's what happened. And so the way they handled it was poor. Um, and I took it personally and they ended up apologizing to me because they realized that they handled it poorly, but I should have realized that it wasn't personal. It wasn't because I had done a bad job. It was only because they, the organization thought it was important that a board member be the chair of this committee and this person wanted to do it. Um, so it really wasn't about me. It was just, um, an organizational decision. And so you have to realize, um, even if it is personal, don't take it personally because it can derail you. It can get, take you off your game. And um, that is not going to be beneficial for you or your organization. All right, be authentic. What does that mean? So authenticity is about being you, being yourself, not putting on airs, not pretending to be somebody else. Um, if you're feeling the imposter syndrome, <laughs> another way to get over it is to find somebody that um, you admire, somebody who you think has, has their act together and emulate them, copy their behaviors um, in your own way. And so some people say that's being inauthentic. Um, I don't think that it is. I think that it's just a way of getting yourself comfortable with the situation so you no longer feel like an imposter. But being authentic is just about being you. Um, I used to, when I was younger, I was always told 
you know, when you're in a professional situation, you have to act professionally at all times. That's super important. And you won't be respected if you're not professional and blah, blah, blah. And I had a situation where my business partner told me that some of the employees were afraid of me. And I was like, why on earth would they be afraid of me? I've never yelled at them. I've never, you know, chastised them. They said, well, she said, well, because they feel like you're always really serious and you never, you know, crack a joke or um, seem like you have, you know, much personality other than work. And so I really thought about it and said, you know, that's true. I, cause I was trained early on that I always have to act professionally. And when I thought about it and said, you know, that's just not who I am. I'm a, I'm a laid back person actually. And so I started cracking jokes in our staff meetings. I started sharing when something went wrong or if I made a mistake or, um, didn't do something as well as I wanted. And by sharing those kinds of things with your team, that makes them really feel connected to you. And that makes them um, care about you and want to follow you more. So like, as an example, um, I talked about connection, the importance of connection earlier and being authentic is one way to create that connection between yourself and the people that you lead. For example, you know, the TV show, The Crown. Before I watched The Crown, I felt nothing about Queen Elizabeth. I mean, yeah, she's there, whatever. No big deal, right? Um, but watching The Crown and seeing the struggles that she had over the years, the um, challenges, the mistakes that she made, it really made me feel connected to her. So to, to see that she wasn't just this perfect person sitting on a throne all day, even though I know that the crown was, you know, a fictional, not 100% um, accurate depiction of her life, it made me feel much more connected to her so that when she passed away this past summer, I was sad about it. And if you think about the people that you um, idolize, want to follow, are fans of, whatever, it's think about the fact that you feel that way about them because you feel connection to them because you feel like you know them as a person. I mean, look at Oprah. So many people admire Oprah because she's real. She talks about her struggles. She talks about her problems and her, you know, difficulties with weight loss and different things. And people feel connected to you when they feel like you're a real person. So I think it's really important as a leader to um, show your, show your real authentic self. Uh, there's a comment in the chat that says, you're not authentic at work. Um, you're not comfortable revealing the real you. Is it time to move on? I guess it depends. I mean, why aren't you comfortable revealing the real you? Do you feel like it'll be used against you? Or is it just that you're, um, do you not trust the people that you work with to be able to share real things and the real you? If that's the case, it might be time to move on. If you, you know, the corporate culture where you work is that of people being um, really competitive and, and nasty and using bad information or whatever. But if that's not the case and it's just you, you might want to just think about, you know, how you can be more authentic. And you don't have to change it overnight, change your work personality overnight, but maybe just start adding in a few um, personal stories every now and then. Or, you know, crack a joke or talk about a time that you screwed something up and laugh about it, that kind of thing. So you don't have to, you know, go from high heels to sneakers overnight. Um, you can do it a little bit at a time, but it is important in order for the people that you lead to feel connected to you. And then the last one I'm going to talk about today is be approachable. Um, this is super important as well, because if your people don't feel comfortable approaching you, um, then they're not gonna tell you the things that you need to know in order to be successful. So being approachable is about that ability to connect with the people, with other people, so that they feel comfortable coming up to you and saying, hey, by the way, here's what's happening on Project XYZ. Um, you know, a lot of leaders say, well, I have an open door policy, but then when someone actually comes into their office, 
they're sitting there on their computer or they're on their phone and, you know, doing this stuff. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And they're not really listening. And when that happens, when you do that, people stop coming, right? Because they feel like you're not really paying attention to them. They don't really don't want to tell you what's happening. But if you put the phone down and give them your attention and be interested in what they have to say, then they'll feel more comfortable coming to you. And you'll find out a lot more information that way that you need in order to be a good leader. You know, if there's a problem with one of your projects and you come across as not approachable, you probably won't find out about it till it's about to blow up. Versus if you're approachable, people will come and tell you early on when there's still time to fix it. So it's really important to be approachable as a leader. So another one of my favorite quotes, a leader takes people where they want to go. A great leader takes people where they don't necessarily want to go, but ought to be. So as the leader, it's your job to figure out where where they need to go and convince them to go with you there. Uh, And that's Rosalind Carter, the former first lady. So in summary, um, this is how you step into your leadership. First of all, accept the fact that you are a leader. You're a leader in your business, your industry, your community, and your family. Being a leader is, or being an effective leader is an ongoing process. There's not just one skill or one mindset that you can master and overnight, boom, you're a leader. It's an ongoing process. So invest in yourself, take training, be in masterminds, read books, podcasts. There's so much material out there about how you can be a better leader. Um, Again, the voice in your head, get Stan to support you and not sabotage you. That's so important. Identify other leaders you admire and emulate their behaviors in your own way so that you're being an authentic to yourself person. See failure as a learning opportunity. And don't forget, that as a leader, you are always leading by example. People are always watching you and they will do what you do, not what you say. Hey, my friend, if you enjoyed listening to this podcast, be sure to rate, review, and share your biggest takeaway. And if you're wanting more, you can access hundreds of recent speakers, book summaries, great articles, and more at no additional charge through your membership portal. You can also get involved in a Women Leaders Association mastermind group or networking group near you. Or if you just need to access your membership portal, simply go to womenleaderspodcast.com to be connected. Because here at Women Leaders Association, we believe we go further, faster, and have more fun when we go together. That's all for today, my friends. Bye for now.